So, oh, is there one more person? Okay. Is it last? I don't know. It let me know. Let me I know I think you need to open it. Nice to see you. Oh, Krishna, I'm here. Everybody, happy new year. Happy new year. Such a great opportunity for you all. You can sit and then uh, chase also. Yes. Hi. Hello. Hi, Krishna. Oh, oh, nice to see nice you. Nice to see you. By driving, I was thinking you will know, definitely go pick her up. Yeah. You think? Oh, I so, because I got reminded okay, I think I will... that you know Seema had asked for. I think we're waiting for people. Yeah. So yeah, um, today I basically like to give a kind of um, overview of the um, of this past for a second. Um, basically, just an overview of um, this spiritual search as I see it. I'm basically a, um, a I would say like a a, a reinterpreter of uh, Ramana Maharishi's great wisdom, and um, uh, I, I have my sort of um, own take on it. But uh, I'll try to give you an overview of that. And I'd also like in the process to um, talk about, I think, the two paths that the two, you know, techniques, for lack of a better word, that, you know, he uh, views as the, the supreme paths of liberation, which would be uh, self-inquiry and surrender. So I'd like to explain those. Um, and I'd like to uh, practice them with you all. Um, and and see how you how you all feel about that, and um, so we'll do that. And I'd also like to say you're welcome to ask questions at any time. So you know, let's make this open. And if you feel um, anything unclear, then then we'll engage in a dialogue about it. Because um, uh, I'm not really a huge um, lecturer, really. I want it to be more open. Um, but that said, I will give a sort of overview. So the way I see it is, and I know many of you, you know, have a long experience with Maharishi's teachings and Advaita generally, but um, I will say essentially, right, what is Vedanta about? Um, the basic idea I always start with uh, is that there is the uh, profound misidentification of yourself with uh, being a person. And uh, the person in the past and the future, um, a body and a mind, and um, this uh, identification with the person is uh, premised on a profound um, illusion. The illusion is not itself in the form of a belief. It is. Uh, it is a. Uh, uh, it is of the quality of a certain kind of special kind of forgetting. So it's the purpose of Vedanta to pierce this forgetting and um, in some sense, dissolve the uh, illusion of identification with the person. The illusion of identification with the person is basically sustained by uh, what I, you know, what I would call essentially attachments, attachments to um, your identity, essentially, um, starting with your body, your thoughts, your past, your future, your relationships, your goals, your desires, your fears, um, you know, that in a way uh, comes from your identity as a person, and it also reinforces your identity as a person. So the basic spiritual process is um, dissolve the attachments, um, uh, at least weaken them sufficiently. And when you do that, what happens is the mind uh, becomes quiet. When the mind becomes quiet, it becomes reflective. And um, in that reflectivity, um, the illusion which sustains the process of identification um, becomes relatively easy to penetrate. 
um, because the illusion is sustained by uh, as well a certain kind of movement of mind. So we're trying to get the mind to a certain kind of stillness uh, by weakening the attachment to keep it moving towards desire and fear. And then uh, once it's gotten relatively still, uh, the final illusion, um, which is very mysterious and beyond words, beyond language can be penetrated. So this is a, you know, um, it sounds very complicated. The reality is, you know, it's uh, in some sense, profoundly simple. The spiritual is extremely, extremely simple. Uh, the complications come from all the resistances we have to actually doing what needs to be done. And what needs to be done, fundamentally needs to be done is the mind has to become uh, one-pointed. It has to become, um, it has to become singularly inwardly focused. And again, what prevents it from becoming inwardly focused are the uh, profound set of beliefs uh, that lead it to desire and fear in the external world. And so through the practices of surrender and or self-inquiry, um, which are the, there could be preliminary practices of various sorts too, but ultimately through those two practices, uh, practices one or the other or both of them, um, uh, uh, the basic structure of the attachments is attacked. They're weakened, the mind is quieted, and then the final illusion is penetrated. That's basically the overview of the search. Now to get there, um, you know, I generally believe that people need um, a couple of preliminary things. One is enough of an intellectual framework that it addresses sufficient doubts um, that they are able to be motivated to do the search. Probably most of you already have that, I suspect. Um, uh, but we should be clear that the fundamental nature of truth is not a set of statements about anything, actually. Even though we read texts, the scriptures and Maharishi's writings and all that say this is that and that is this, statements are not the truth. The truth is beyond statements. The truth is beyond the mind. The truth is outside of our conceptual framework. We're ultimately trying to break out of a conceptual prism. That's what we're trying to do. The concepts are there basically to, um, first of all, give us enough faith to proceed. And secondly, to break our current concepts. So we have new concepts to break our current concepts. This idea of, you know, a thorn to remove a thorn. So, you know, we have the idea, for example, let's just give an example of um, what is not the doer. What is not the doer? You know, uh, that's because we normally think as part of identification of the body and the mind that we are the doer. You know, strictly speaking, it's not exactly the case that you are the doer or are not the doer. Both statements are wrong because both statements come from, um, they come from language, they come from thinking, <laughs> uh, and thinking itself is premised on um, individuality, which is, that's the illusion. So illusion gives rise to language, thought, and concept. Um, and to break one set of conventional concepts, we use an unconventional set of concepts. But ultimately, we don't want to be left with concepts. We're trying to get beyond concepts. So we should understand that. There are a lot of these little sort of details that we can go over you know, as questions arise. But uh, just to be clear about that. So that's, we want intellectual framework. Some people need more than others. I certainly needed during you know, my seeking time, so to say, uh, a lot of questions answered, but some people are lucky, like Maharishi, they didn't need anything at all. They already had you know, sufficient faith very early on. Perhaps they're, uh, perhaps as he, as he said, you know, his uh, encounters with um, philosophy and all that were done in prior lives, perhaps that was so. Um, but anyway, some intellectual framework is required. Uh, Secondly, I think um, this is a very broad domain. Um, some degree, and it's an interesting question how much exactly, but some degree of emotional equanimity is required. You know, some degree of what I call emotional health is required. Um, I was just talking earlier today about, uh, you know, the importance, in my opinion, this is where I think there's a certain like modern element in what I teach um, of the importance of something like uh, the right kind of therapy for, for people. Um, I think that can be helpful for seekers in, in many instances because uh, there are, um, there are uh, 
unconscious aspects of their emotions they haven't dealt with and that can hinder the search. And um, in prior times, these were dealt with in other ways. Um, and those ways are still valid, of course, you know. So in the in the Vedantic tradition, you know, you have the idea of people sort of going up certain sort of steps, right? It could be um, at the beginning mm -hmm. as a child, you go to the temple, right? Then later, um, you know, you perform karma yoga, right? There are various kinds of purificatory methods that are not the ultimate methods, but that as you do them, pranayama or mantra chanting, japa, this, that, and the other thing, right? Um, that uh, quiet the mind and that help people deal with emotional difficulties. And I think in the modern world, you have things like therapy, which can also help. But um, I just want, I, I, I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth uh, about it, um, except perhaps in response to questions, but um, I just want you to keep in mind because what happens is that seekers often encounter um, unknown difficulties they don't comprehend. Those difficulties are of a like motivational nature. Like they think, oh, I, I know what to do, but I'm not doing it. Why am I not doing it? And the answer is because there are, uh, as I put it earlier today, like there's unfinished psychological, emotional business, often coming from childhood. Um, it's not, doesn't necessarily have to be some giant trauma. Um, people think, oh, like, oh, you know, I, I had a pretty good childhood, but the reality is everybody has, has um, everyone has issues from the past. And just to recognize and keep in mind that if you have seemingly um, difficult to comprehend problems, you know, that are seem to be stopping your spiritual progress, that one very important source of those problems might be the um, emotional issues that are undealt with. Um, so yeah, so anyone has more questions about that later, I can go into them detail. And then so so that you have these two two or three pieces, right? So intellectual framework is there, then there's some some degree of emotional equilibrium. It doesn't have to be perfect, right? But enough basically what basically enough that you can pursue um, the spiritual with some reasonable degree of vigor, you know? And then the sort of third piece, the most important piece, the sort of you know, tip of the spear, you might say are the actual practices that, um, that will penetrate the, you know, uh, the, the illusion that sustains the structure of the ego, but the structure of the belief that I'm a person. So what are these two practices? So um, as I said earlier, I, uh, I classify them as self-inquiry and surrender. And I view them as really sides of a coin but it tends to be that some people prefer one to the other, you know, and some people um, do both. And that's totally fine because ultimately they are like very, very linked, um, but they have slightly different flavors is the way I would say it. So self-inquiry, I think, appeals a little bit more to um, the curious mind. I want to know the truth. I want to understand, you know, for that kind of thing, self-inquiry is, you know, makes sense. Um, there are others for whom I just want peace, like out of suffering, get me out of suffering right now. And for that, surrender is, you know, uh, you know a bit more appealing basically. But as you'll see, um, they both have, um, they both have, are, are, are rooted really in something very, very similar at the end. Um, and so uh, you can do either one or both. So um, I've given you an overview and, you know, assuming that uh, uh, pretty much everyone has, you know, some foundations already, but uh, I want to ask if anyone has, has any questions at the moment. I can go into any more detail. I mean, there's a lot of things I can keep talking about uh, if there are any, any, if there's any confusion or, or questions so far. Okay, so. Actually, I can oh, just take a quick sure. um, So surrender requires a, a belief system and then a structure to, uh, to a notion of Ishwara, do, do the other additional concepts needed for surrender in this path, or so is, is, is it is it surrender to something? Or no, to how, how is, how that, is that? that's a good question. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go over surrender. I'll, I'll go over both okay. in detail. Um, but um, but basically the answer is uh, you do not need to surrender to something, and you can if you like. You can conceptualize it like that. You can conceptualize it as surrender to God if you like. Um, nothing wrong with that. And in fact, um, I'll say very clearly that. Uh, um, you know, this is a process about the, this is shot through with the divine, you know, so, you know, God is in this process and, 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 you know, I do think that, that it is, I don't think it will be, you know, I don't think it'll be surprised to anybody here or, or 
I just think most people will probably agree with me here in this audience, but you know, um, certainly asking God for help is uh, a great thing to do, you know, pray for help on this process for sure. Um, but that said, you know, uh, ultimately, um, God as a concept is a concept, you know, so we are trying to get rid of all concepts ultimately. So, you know, you can, you can surrender to God if you like, you don't need to surrender to God if you don't want to, uh, per se, per se. Um, but ultimately, that's what's exactly what's happening, whether you say it as that or not. So, um, so let's start with self-inquiry, actually. So, and then we'll come to surrender. So, uh, so self-inquiry notoriously tricky. And I will say, you know, for both self-inquiry and surrender, the, the heart, the heart of the spiritual search is these practices. You know, it is, it is looking inward. Like, like Maharishi says, you know, um, the scriptures can point out like the sun to you, but you have to look, you have to look. The point is to look, you know, people always confuse me, even in, in you know, Zen Buddhist koans and all that, they talk about, you know, the finger pointing to the moon and the disciple looks at the finger, you know, <laughs> it's, this is notorious because the problem is that what we're talking about is something which is outside the mind. As soon as you speak about it, now it's inside the mind. So the problem is, as soon as you talk about it, it's distorted. However you talk about it, it's distorted. There's no way of getting around the distortion. That's why we go round and round in circles because there's something which can't be said. There's always something which can't be said. You can't say it. No matter how off, how you try to say it, you won't be able to say it. And you know, um, it doesn't matter how eloquent you are, it can't be said. It can't be said, it can't be said. So that's why it's pointed to in a thousand and one different ways. But no matter how it's pointed to, ultimately you have to go within go with it, go with it. And so these, these methods of, of inquiry and surrender are themselves the supreme teachers. There is something which is built into them, which is um, uh, inherently, I'll say, inherently a little confusing, inherently. And that confusion is good because if they were not confusing, that would mean that they were um, static static methods, but they're not really static methods. They are unfolding. As you do them, you learn what they are. They teach you what they are. And as you think you know them, then you know them further and further. You're like, oh my God, now I understand it better. Now I understand it better because it's actually not what it seems to be. That's the structure of the illusion too. It's also not what it seems to be. Nothing is as it seems to be. That's, you know, that, that's, that it's trying to show you this. So, um, because the truth is, you know, um, there's all kinds of, um, <laughs> there's all kinds of things I could say, you know, um, the truth is that what is, is what it is already. That is, you are what you are already. And, you know, um, what you are actually is not a person. So what you are is not conditioned. What you are is not ignorant in the end. In the end, what you are is not taken in by the illusion. Even now, there's no illusion. There's no illusion. And yet the same, the same way you say there is an illusion. There is an, we have to treat, there, you have to simultaneously maintain in mind contradictory concepts that you are already the pure self, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you're a seeker and you're seeking to know that. So how is that possible? Well, so it's, it's, it's because ignorance, but ignorance, what is ignorance? What is ignorance? What actually is ignorance? What is ignorance? As you look for ignorance, ignorance disappears. So, so ignorance turns out never to have existed. This is the nature of things. It's very, very, so Maya is magical, basically. You know, there's something where when you look for it, it disappears, it vanishes. So, um, so, so we have to keep these, you know, um, sort of uh, contradictory ideas uh, in mind that there, that, yeah, <laughs> um, there is something, there's something which, which just continuously, uh, evades perception. So anyway, back to inquiry now, um, the way I like to describe inquiry is, uh, right now there is the basic sense you have of your own existence, Like you know, right now I'm here, I'm alive, I'm awake. Like I'm, I'm perceiving, I'm thinking, I'm feeling. So what we're trying to do in inquiry is. Who is perceiving? Turn, yes, who is perceiving? 
But, but, how, but what do we mean by that question? What we mean by that question is not to conceptually think about it. I mean, I think these are all part of the process. You will be conceptually thinking about it automatically, whether you like it or not. But to turn our attention towards whatever that sense is. I should say, really, attempt to turn our attention towards whatever that source is. So we have this sense, like just for example, if you had like um, you know, um, an itch on your, you know, on your arm, your arm was itchy, you could, I could say, you know, pay attention to that itch, and you would immediately your attention would be turned towards that, right? Um, similarly, if I said that sense you have of your own existence, of your own being, turn your attention towards that. Now, here's a tricky thing. If I, if, I, if I say right now, turn your attention towards that, and I say, where is that? Like, can someone say where, 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 where immediately uh, they feel that themselves to be? No. You say no, which is totally fine. But um, uh, anyone else have any other answers? No, I'm just curious. Proceeding as yourself, uh -huh. You see, you know, if you think who is the person who is feeling, uh -huh. So it is somewhere in, within the body, the diva, somewhere, the diva. somewhere in your diva, somewhere in your conscious, somewhere in your buddhi and the intellect, and the body is right. there, something like that. Okay. But when you focus on it, that the attention is who is looking. So when you when you start looking at that, thing, yes. So if you see how I'm, I'm existing here, right? Where am I existing? Through this body only I'm existing. That's why I perceive myself. So, but I am not the body. Who am I? Where is? Where am I? What? Who, am I? who is listening to your lecture? Yes, yes, yes. That's where I see it. Yes, yes, yes. Well, so no, Dad. So, so you're all you're all on the right track, right? So I just want to so note these different answers, right? So the first answer is no. You can't tell where it is. And you have body, jiva, and then the sort of like attention going through the through the body, right? And, and you said, you know, um, yeah, like yeah, but, but but who is who is aware of that, right? Essentially. So you're getting to the point, which is which is. When you look for yourself, um, which is that when, um, knowledge you have, go ahead, sorry. To put it uh, like a simplistic thing, for example, if I introduce myself, I say I am. Okay, yes. Point to a specific part in the I don't I am. <laughs> yeah, so this is right. This is my, so yeah, so you're you're talking about this Maharishi's um, notorious uh, focus on our heart. So, yes, <laughs> yes, which which I have to say, you know, um, I, I think it, it spoke to him, but I, I, I think it's as um, it can be a little misleading because he, he had to clarify what he meant by the heart was really the source. You know, he felt he felt that there was um, this sort of it was kind of meditative center, I feel like that you could sort of um, come to this sort of center. Uh, uh, um, there's some kind of quasi physical, you know, uh, contemplative center there. But then you had to clarify that he really meant by heart, he meant the source. You know, so so we'll come to that in a little bit. But so Brett, uh, Maharshi has also described that. So you see, self is inside you. The self and the mind through mind, the uh, buddhi is a sort of seat of mind. And the, the reflection of the self is also outwardly you're looking through the brain or the buddhi and the mind. That's all your focus is. Your focus is through that. That's what I read in one of his sure. questions. Sure, sure, sure. Correct. No, so, 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 but the, the, the important thing to note about that, um, that concept and the heart and the no and the jiva, all of these things, right, <laughs> is, is when you are looking, what you're looking for is basically experiential, okay? You are experiencing your own being that right now. The question is, what is the nature of that information? How do you know that you are right now? How, where in your experience is that exactly? And so the, and the cardinal rule of inquiry is, whatever response comes up as you look for it, you have to ask yourself, Am I aware of this, whatever it is, whether it be a concept, this concept of uh, something filtering through consciousness and through the through the buddhi in the mind, or whether it be the jiva or the body, or even even the answer no, right? right? All of these are things you're aware of. So the uh, response, inquiry has to be okay. Um, 
this is not the answer. This is not the answer. Even I don't know would be against something which is not the answer. Um, uh, as you uh, look for yourself, I, I sort of compare this, and I don't know is actually you know, in many ways uh, a sign of progress, but, um, but uh, I kind of liken it to, um, you know, in a dark room, if you were looking for uh, a flashlight, okay? And then you basically are holding the flashlight in your hand and you, sh and, 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 and you are shining it on a banner which reads, I don't know where the flashlight is. That's what's happening, basically. Because you're looking for yourself and you, know, you find uh, you don't know where you are perhaps, right? And so um, uh, uh, ironically, that sense of not knowing is itself known by you. Yes. So that sense is there. And so what you're doing is you have to hunt, hunt what that is. What exactly is that sense? Turn, as you, as you said, you know, the attention on itself. Where is attention? What is attention itself? The looker, where is the looker, basically? You're looking, because the thing is, you seem to know that you are looking. You seem to know that I'm here, I'm looking. But what is the nature of that? What exactly is it that you know? What is that knowing? What is that knowing? That knowing, <clears throat> which you're, it's like you're continuously tasting something, but what is it that you're tasting? As soon as you go looking for it, suddenly it becomes somehow elusive. Like what exactly is that precisely? You know, you can imagine um, your experience as being like a, like, like a pole, okay? One side of the pole is the thing that you're experiencing. And the other side of the pole is you, like you're holding this pole. And normally our attention is always on the opposite side of the pole, mm -hmm. that's the object. And we're trying to turn it towards what's holding this side of the pole, <laughs> that's what's happening. So the problem is, you know, <laughs> you seem to have come to this side of the pole, but then this side of the pole seems to be just an extension of that side of the pole. Mm -hmm. And you have to go further. So, so as these answers keep coming up, you have to ask yourself, who is aware of this answer? And again, renew your sense of being the knower of the answer. That sense of knowing, I am the one who knows this. I am the one who has this thought. I am the one who has this feeling. So where am I? That means I'm separate. You know, the, the basic principle is, right? Anything you're aware of, you cannot be because if you were it, then you wouldn't be able to experience it, right? So, so therefore, and yet, and yet, you know, here you are, where are you, where are you? That this is, this is, the, the, this is, this is, this is the elusive question. So um, I'm giving you kind of a basic idea of the technique. Um, any so, questions so far? Yeah, I so want to do a little practice I, actually. I have a quick, uh, yeah, go ahead. So, so the practice of being aware that I'm aware, you know, there's all kind of practice where you yes. say words and you stick with I'm awareness being aware. So yeah. I'm just all that I'm aware that I'm aware. Yes. Is that close enough to this thing or is it you know different? that is which is kind of being self-absorbed, so you're not there's no body consciousness, there's nothing, and at some point you go into a sort of a, a sense of void and and, and, and it's it becomes whatever and you might feel it as a current, you might feel it as a void, but then Temporarily, you, you've withdrawn your, yourself into yourself. Right? Yeah. Well, well uh, no, there is an alertness, which. Yeah, the alertness is there. critical. The alertness is critical. You know, that practice of being aware that you're aware is, um, uh, how to put it, um, it's close and it's not necessarily, you know, um, I, I could in a way say, uh, it's fine, which is uh -huh. which is kind of true. But I also think that the, it's not as precise as I would like because uh, you know my preference is to say there's a difficulty with that because when you say that you're aware that you're aware, um, what you're actually aware of is a thought. True. See, as soon as you say I'm aware that I'm aware, now you, what True. happens is people think there's a there's a subtle feeling. They're like, oh, that's my awareness. They make that the thing that they're focusing on. And, and what I, I prefer is that people recognize this is, a, this is also a thought. I'm aware. And I'm looking for the one that's aware of that. 
you know? So that, so we're trying, we're looking for this awareness. Where is the awareness exactly? There's only a series of thoughts, but, where, but there must be awareness somewhere because otherwise, how would you know that there's a series of thoughts? So this is the paradox that we're faced with, you know? And so it's like, you're chasing the horizon, you know? That's what's happening. If, 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 you, if, I, if I say, look at the horizon, but the reality is you're only looking at some object between you and the horizon. So to keep on going towards the horizon, um, and in that process, uh, uh, things happen. Basically, you know, that process you you strip away you strip away the layers and layers of identification, um, and and uh, ultimately, you know, something breaks down. Is what and this awareness that he's talking about sometimes it lasts just for a second, not more than that. Then again, you are again thinking. You know, you're thinking again starts. Right, right. Well, so so now so now and you're saying that, that uh, condition that we are looking for. That no thoughts, it lasts very short. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, so 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 you're bringing up two things. One is that there that there are times when 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 you when you practice and you come to a condition of no thought, um, and then you say, uh, yeah, but it doesn't last. So so uh, yes, on, on the one hand, in, in a sense, we are looking to some extent for a condition of no thought. It's partly true, but I think you bring up immediately the problem with that, which is. Which is also to be kept in mind. Um, the issue is anything which comes goes. Anything which comes goes, and this is true of any mystical experience of any kind. Mm -hmm. So um, even if you recognize something, oh wow, like you suddenly get it. Anything can be gotten, can be ungotten. So so uh, in a sense, even though I just said what we're trying to do is still the mind and then find out what we really are, we have to immediately recognize that there is a problem with this conception. There's a problem with every conception. That's, what, that's what's going on here. That states of no thought are not in themselves sufficient because they go away. You know, we do want to try to prolong them. It's true. We're trying through our practice to um, deepen it, deepen it, deepen it. But what we're really, what, you, what you're really pointing out is a state of supposedly no thought is not a state of no thought. It is a thought. It's a subtle thought. So we're trying to go beyond even that subtle thought. That's, you know, anything which has a duration is a thought. So even states of peace, which start and stop, are thoughts. They're thoughts. How come we read about these, uh, some of the yogis that they stay in um, this state of whatever you call samadhi? Sure. Or whatever. For uh, hours and hours and hours, and like uh, if you read um, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa's life, and when uh, that uh, Totaji came to give him uh, the lessons, and um, he pushed that, he said, Okay, uh, concentrate on that. And he went into Nirvikal for Samadhi. Sure. And then he thought that somebody would come and tell him, Okay, he's away. But he just stayed in that state for more than 48 hours. Sure, and sure. Finally, Totanji got worried that what happened, whether he's dead or alive. And he went to look and he was still in that Nirvikal for the Samadhi state. Uh, sure. But as you point out, you know, it's a state. It's a state. So, so it, it, he eventually came out of it, right? No matter how long a state lasts, it comes to an end. Uh, this Totan Maharaj had to shake him up and bring him out of that. Eventually, it came to an end. Doesn't matter how it comes to an end. Okay. You know, it comes to an end. Yeah. And Maharishi says that. He says very clearly, one can sit in Nirva Kapil Samadhi for years on end. That by itself is not going to be sufficient. It doesn't matter if the mind is relatively thoughtless for a long period of time if the final discernment that's required has not been made. Discernment is the ultimate point of the practice. We're trying to look, go subtler and subtler and subtler and subtler and subtler, you know, um, with again the practice which we, which we should practice soon. But um uh <laughs> but but it doesn't matter how long you stay. That's why Marish is very clear, you know. Um, um you know, you could last, you could be in it for a thousand years, it wouldn't matter because it's just like going to sleep, you know, like it doesn't matter how long you sleep when you wake up. You still have the mind, so the, the final matter hasn't been penetrated. So what we're trying to do is what we're trying to do is you know is um, is 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 uh, recognize 
what that seemingly thoughtless state is pointing to. Because that thoughtless state is important, don't get me wrong, it is important, but it's not the final goal. It's a reflection of who you are. And so our task is to recognize, try to recognize uh, what that reflection is pointing to, essentially. Um, okay, so I want, I want to try uh, just a practice here for like five minutes, okay? I want you all to just try to look for yourself um, and uh, just see where that goes. And anything that comes up in response to it, immediately try to notice the fact that it is um, an object of which you're aware and to re and renew your, um, your uh, 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 seeking of, of, of your own sense of your own existence. I will also say, by the way, um, uh, before I start a timer here in a second, is um, I should have said this earlier as well, but, but the basic um, rule of, of the practice for serious seekers is the, the aspiration. I know it's not going to happen for a long time um, for many people, but um, the aspiration is to do these practices, surrender or self-inquiry, at all waking moments, at all waking moments. Initially, if you can't do that, you do it whenever you can. You make it to one second, for one second, that's better than zero seconds. But, um, but the aspiration is all the time because it's only when these practices confront your other desires and fears that they will have the ability to dissolve them. You know, they're like the fire that can dissolve them. Unless they confront them, they can't dissolve them. So um, anyway, that's, um, I will say that. So let's try it just for five minutes. I'm curious uh, what your experiences will be. Um, so I'll set a little timer. And uh, and then I'll I'll ask you so what you're saying. So look the practice again. So look for the existence. Yes. So look. So basically, when you say I, or you think about your own awareness, or your own um, do I exist or, or my existence? Yes, your own existence. You have a sense of it. Sense you, know, like, of it. you seem to have a sense of your own existence. I'm here. I'm here somewhere. Right. Where are you? Basically, I could I could ask that to turn try to turn your attention and find where is this sense of your own being? Where is it? Like what is it? What there is some knowledge that you have that I'm here, but but how do you know that? What exactly is does that consist of? Because when you look, for example, at this carpet or something like that, the carpet is not telling you that you exist, right? The carpet is there. You somehow know <coughs> when you look at the carpet. I the carpet is here. I am not the carpet. I'm separate from the carpet, right? I'm aware. I'm aware of the carpet. I'm aware that I'm not the carpet. You know, um, so you have this separate knowledge that I am, and I'm not the carpet. Right. So that knowledge, that separate piece of knowledge, like how do you know that? It's somehow known, but how? What is that knowledge? Like turn towards that knowledge, or turn towards you. It's all the same. There's there's, there's an element you can see here, right? There's an element of it's almost difficult to articulate what you're looking for, but you know it because you have been taught. Well, <laughs> you you have you have a basic Memory elementary, you have a basic elementary knowledge of your own existence. Somehow it seems beyond doubt. So we need to find what that is. You know, I, I use a metaphor sometimes, like suppose, for example, you were, you know, I don't know, you were tasting um, some um, I don't know, some uh, highly complex food or something like that, right? And someone said, okay, you're eating this pudding or something and, um, you know, it's, uh, it's chocolate, but, um, but there's a very, very, very faint hint of strawberries, okay? So you have to taste it. And you're like, oh yeah, maybe, there, maybe it is there. And you really have to focus and try to see if you can pinpoint that flavor. Like, can you focus on it? It's very, very, very quiet, but you're trying to focus, bring it into focus. There's something in the background here, which we're trying to bring into focus. So that, that's what we're trying, to, we're trying to do here. And so try, try, give it five minutes, just try it, and then we'll, we'll discuss. So I'm gonna set a little five minute timer, and, uh, and then we'll talk about it. I'll also say one more thing, which is I recommend uh, uh, 
not a this is not an absolute, but I do recommend I, uh, I do it with your eyes open because it is more exportable to be to real life, you know. Um, yeah. So you want those with a cool eyes open? I don't have to, but I recommend it. You know, if you really prefer to keep your eyes closed, keep your eyes closed. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have to look at the carpet. <laughs> sure. <laughs>
All right. Anyone like to share their experience? Mm -hmm. yeah, my problem is hard. It's, uh, it's kind of exciting. I was trying to force parts into my mind to stimulate it by different something. Uh -huh. uh, even those parts did not stay the other second. Uh -huh. So it's kind of totally blind. Good. But I am not. I was kind of a little afraid. Why is it blind? I should force my thoughts onto myself. Should I think about this? Or should I think about that? Or should I look at the very least? Not things like that. So try to get through those thoughts quickly and mentally. So by and large, you know, it's just kind of blind. Quite right. express that beyond that. Okay. There was a moment where uh, I was kind of thinking, when will this time in his head? Uh huh. Uh -huh. But, uh, sure. Sure, sure. So it's interesting. I think you're showing, right? Like this is one of the great powers of, of this method is that it it like shoots down thought in the process, you know. Um, and you get to, like you say, or can get to a uh, state which is relatively blank. Um, so this is some variety of uh, you know, some variety of some kind of piece essentially. But what we want to do is, and you know, like we'll be five minutes I know, but um, <laughs> but is um recognize that this blankness is occurring to me, right? I'm aware of this blankness and pursue that uh, one who is aware of it. So sometimes what happens is, yeah, in that, in that piece, the subject, the subject becomes, subject meaning you, becomes subtler. And so, um, uh, you have to recognize, recognize, I'm still here. This, this is still an experience. It's occurring to me. Blankness is not true blankness. It's a, it's a, like a covering thought, basically. And so you have to recognize it's a covering thought. I'm aware of it. Where am I? Um, but even that little process of trying so far, right? You saw it. Your thoughts, many of your thoughts disappeared in that process, which is, which is great. So, um, and so it's like a little laser beam shooting them down. Um, others? I think I was uh, trying to remember the, the comments you gave saying the mind, it's outside mind. Yes. We don't know what is it is outside mind. When you say it is inside the mind and you put it into words, it's not that. Yes. So I was <laughs> that's, that's what I was referring to you. To that <laughs> thought process. But then I, I also thought that I think the, the calmer it gets, the implicateness of the living itself reveals it looks like mm -hmm. the, the, the intricateness of, 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 of living, living itself. Living or our life as, I mean, we are so superficially living that you don't see the subtleness mm. of things around. Like if I'm concentrating on my dress or on the carpet, the intricate design. You're not ever seen. Right, 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 right. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's another it's very interesting effect you're talking about, which is, you know, which is like there's a uh, everything snap can snap into greater clarity. Exactly. Yeah, that's definitely true. Definitely true. Like I could see the design on my shirt or the design on the car, wherever my eyes was focused. Right, because what's happening is a lot of the habitual, uh, habitual ways of thinking which 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 blind you normally are like temporarily muted. Um so we cannot think beyond object or person. <laughs> that's what usually happens. That, that's all we keep thinking. That's what usually happens. All day, all the time. That's all the time. Exactly. That's exactly right. So, but I want to point out, right? You know, so it's interesting. Your mind got caught up in what I had said about yeah. this being outside the mind. You know, which, which, um, <laughs> which is in a way, uh, it's a good thing in a way, um, uh, because because you know, it is sometimes a purpose of these things to, um, kind of. Throw a wrench into the gears of the exactly. mind, but um, I'm saying, man, I don't even know what it is. Exactly. No, it's <laughs> it my mind. I don't know. No, exactly. Well, but by definition, it's beyond my mind. Well, that's right. That's exactly right. But with but with inquiry, we'll just say, right? <clears throat> we're not looking for something abstract, right? You're experiencing it. This is the base, like, uh, uh, landmark. You have to always come back to again and again and again, which is 
you know your own existence. It feels so obvious. Where is that sense of obviousness coming from? That's, that's the question. It's like, it's like you're touching something all the time. And then you're like, well, what exactly is it that I'm touching? And as soon as you look for it, well, now I'm not sure what I'm touching. You see? Like that's, that's what's happening, right? You're literally in contact with it. You're, it's in your, it's as if, as if, not exactly the same as, but it's as if you are perceiving something something all the time, all the time. In fact, it's so constant that it's disappeared because it's literally constantly seeing, if you see the same, same thing constantly, it will vanish because there's nothing to contrast it against. So um, to come back to that element that, what you're, that we're not trying to solve a riddle in the conceptual sense, we're trying to find something that we are currently experiencing or seem to be experiencing. That's something that is so fundamentally <clears throat> tangible in a sense, seemingly, um, that it's shocking that when we go looking for it, suddenly we're confused. You know, but even that very confusion, we're aware of that confusion. So that's mm -hmm. how that's how this process goes. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Others, anyone on Zoom perhaps or uh -huh. Anybody in the Zoom? You have any questions? Or, or um, if you want to share? Yeah. Uh, namaste, um, Akhilesh Jade. Uh, my name is Savita. I'm just going to turn my camera on. Um, yeah, so um, this exercise was interesting. It wasn't like meditation. It was just kind of, uh, I don't know. I was just trying to be aware of uh, whatever it is that came up into my in the field of awareness, I was aware of my body sensations. I was aware of my breath, my thoughts, uh, whatever feelings were coming up, and and just and I was also aware that I was aware. But then I noticed that there were times when I was just aware, and then there were times when I would get identified with with what I was aware of, and then I, I noticed that transition because I was able to step away from it and then continue to just be neutrally aware. Um, so I, I don't know, that that is just my experience. Um, Fascinating, yeah, exactly. So you kind of notice how the mind goes sometimes from being identified or absorbed in something to not being absorbed in it, which is a critical thing actually. Because as soon as you go looking for you, what happens is it becomes difficult at that moment to believe that you're this thing that's passing through. That's part of the purpose of this activity. And that's part of the purpose of this activity being maintained all the time. Because it's something very similar to um, if, I, if I tell you to, uh, to look at a mirror, okay? But I want you to notice the sh uh, you know, shiny, silvery, reflective surface of the mirror. That's very counterintuitive, right? Because if you look at a mirror, your eye is drawn to the objects in it. If you notice the mirror itself, what happens to the objects is the question. They blur, they blur, right? The moment you notice the surface of the mirror, the objects blur because your mind can't keep both simultaneously. So, um, you know, now, Self-inquiry complicates the metaphor a little bit because as soon as you think you've noticed the surface of the mirror, it turns out that supposed surface of the mirror that you've noticed is actually itself a reflection in another mirror. So you're continuously hunting, hunting the silvery surface of the mirror again and again and again and again and again. But um, uh, I think you're absolutely right that it, it disidentifies you the things in the process. So, so what is a what would be the next step of of that inquiry? Like, yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the next step of inquiry is uh, the only step of inquiry is to do this continuously. I mean, we can we can practice again, but maybe what I'm thinking I'm doing is I'm gonna think I'm gonna explain surrender, we'll practice surrender, and then we can come back. 
um, because that you, you can see the links between these two. Uh, but the idea is to practice this hunt for yourself, this experiential hunt for yourself all the time. You know, in a way, I feel like the first big and important step, maybe, yeah, at least half of, half of the value of inquiry is recognizing how profound a thing it is that you don't know who you are. That not knowing, if you really let it strike you, is transformative. Because it's like, um, you know, I give people this example sometimes, you know, it's as if, for example, you, um, I don't know, you're going through a normal day and then you go into the bathroom and you look in the mirror and someone else's face is staring back at you. <laughs> right? So you go out in the bathroom and nobody acts any different. They all act as if like it's totally normal. You go back in the bathroom, you see the same thing, right? At that moment, how important is the meeting that you have in half an hour, right? Like totally zero, right? <laughs> Like, am I going insane? What's happening? Do I have cancer? Like, what's 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 happening? Right, you're you're totally occupied with that. That's in fact the situation that we're in. That our life is built around um, I, who supposedly is X, Y, and Z, and has all these issues and complications and wants this and that other thing. But when we actually look for it, we're baffled. We don't actually know what that means. And that should strike a chord of horror and awe, you know, because that's the actual fact. What happens is it's, it, it's like, again, it's like, you know, you're walking through your house and you open a door and it's as if it had like a, a portal to another dimension there or something like that. And then imagine you just shut the door and let's just pretend it doesn't exist because <laughs> it's so much easier that way, right? If you really absorb the implication of it, it upends everything. So um, that's, that's, you know, that's one of the, main tasks of this exercise really. So actually so this this process, right? So I you know, found myself deconstructing <coughs> the, the usual life, mm -hmm. right? It's mm -hmm. deconstructed in the process. But then I have to reconstruct it to, to sort of follow your to remind myself to practice your techniques. Uh -huh, right? uh -huh, uh -huh. So that so that goes on uh, you know uh, so is that something that keeps going on? Well so I have to reconstruct it temporarily to Say, hey, am I doing the right thing? You know, I, I come back. Uh, yeah. So, 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 so I need to revive my eye to sort of put that effort. Um, yeah, I, I'll say that's fine. So you know, you know, uh, uh, it's true that you know, um, when we drive both surrender and, and inquiry uh, to to their limits, um, we face this question of you know, um, uh, you know, at what point do we stop? And my position on that, and I believe it's also my position on this point, is um, is you should not stop as long as this question can even occur to you. So, um, so uh, uh, effort will be taken from you forcibly when it's when 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 um, when that needs to happen. But um, but one thing should be clung to uh, as long as it's possible to cling to it, which is the practice. So so uh, as long as this question occurs, because the thing is, we say deconstructing the eye, bringing it back together. Who has this question? See, so there's a subtle eye lurking there. You see, it hasn't been fully deconstructed. Mm. Um, so that so that has to be continued. Then, uh, other questions so far? I have a question. Is it something like? Uh, so before I ask that question, my experience was it was easier for me to close that. Okay, sure. So the question is: Is it something like when we're trying to solve a puzzle and we are chasing the solution, it doesn't strike the mind, and suddenly through a flash of insight, the answer is obvious. And perhaps in hindsight, it was obvious. Uh, or perhaps somebody else gives you the solution and it's obvious. Well, how come I didn't think of it? Mm -hmm. Is it something like that? Um, yeah, you could say there's a kind of flash of insight. Um, you know, I would say, right, that the basic, you know, like I said earlier, the basic obstacle to the insight is the attachments. Because what happens is you can view it as there's a door. You open the door, 
and through the door you you can enter paradise let's say okay but um but you have it's not just you behind you there's like a hundred people that are holding you okay they're like there's ropes around you they're holding you okay and um they don't think it's paradise they think it's hell <laughs> <laughs> so so you're trying to open the door but they're preventing you from doing more than and certainly they're preventing you from entering you know, so so the, the, the insight that is um, being sought is being obscured by parts of yourself that do not want the insight because they view the insight as death, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, so that's the that's the real issue, if that makes sense. So it is. Yeah, yeah there is, of course, you know, there's an element of insight. You can, you know, I view it as, you know, there's sort of. Um, you know, at least you know, <laughs> at least three ways of viewing this process. There is a gradual element of the process. The gradual element is slowly destroy the attachments, the vasana, slowly destroy them, right? More and more and more purity, right? Um, and uh, and you know that that's one way of viewing things. That one is moving towards continuously moving towards purity. That's true. Then there's a second way of looking at the process, which is um, you know uh, the sudden flash of insight. That we're looking for the sudden flash of insight. Um, that's really, you know, related really is the truth to this first view because as and when the attachment weakens gradually, it prepares the ground to allow for the sudden flash of insight. But what is the insight? And the insight actually is that the entire way that we've been thinking about this whole process is wrong. And that in fact, there was never any problem <laughs> and there was therefore never any solution. And that's, you might say, the absolute perspective. The absolute perspective kind of negates the core, the content of the insight is that the first the first two perspectives are wrong, including the inside perspective. So it kind of inside itself erases itself, you know, um, because the idea of insight is based on the idea that there really was um, uh, a problem to begin with. There's really a problem and there's really a solution. But actually, the sol solution is that the problem is non-existent. So there's something there with then the mind, right? The mind can't comprehend it. And that's what that's the problem is being that's the whole issue because the mind wants to look for a mental object it wants something that it can grasp but the problem is if it were graspable it would be a limited thing but we're looking for something that's not limited so we're looking for the deconstruction of all the limits and what will remain then is something the mind can't grasp but that's a problem for the mind because the mind is like well how can that be a satisfying solution so what happens is over the course of the practice, um, the mind um, learns to let go, it learns to trust. And that's what faith is, right? In a way, what happens is it, there's something there, the mind um, learns to content itself to be in the shadow of, you might say, right? It won't actually ever understand. Mind cannot understand. It deep, deep, could be understood. Deep, yeah. deep faith, that's what is happening. Your mind is not awake. Deep sleep, sleep. What happened? Exactly. In a sense, right. Waking deep sleep. Waking, waking deep sleep. So, you know, which is itself, right? It sounds like a contradiction. <laughs> waking sleep, dream sleep, and deep sleep. So, deep sleep, 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 what we are, are we? Uh, actually. You know, mind is also sleeping. Yeah, that's, well, in a way, that's right. Yeah. The, the mind, in a sense, goes to sleep. Of course, as you know, long as we there's, there's a. So, there is a game. I mean, you no. Know, so, we are playing a certain sort of game. Like, let's be clear, right? We are playing a certain sort of game where we are looking for certain flashes of insight. But we should be aware that the certain kind of flash of insight is of a of a kind that is inconceivable, yeah. basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that said, we are playing a game. So, you know, because yeah, otherwise the, the whole thing is we're this is this is this is this is um. Um, this is the supreme game, you might say, we're playing. So, um, you know. Uh, play of consciousness. It's a play of consciousness <laughs> in, a, in a sense, right? Consciousness itself is not really disturbed by anything in the first place. So the question is, well, what's going on? That's the nature of this game is, well, what's going on then? If I am supreme consciousness, if I'm supreme consciousness and consciousness is already perfect, which it is, what's the problem? Yeah. Who is getting the That's the question. What's the problem? Who has the problem exactly? That's the question. That's what inquiry is. And it goes through this, mm, this experiential eye, 
that is the locus of the issue. Where's me right now? Because I seem to know that I'm here, but what's that me? Where is me? Where is me right now? The me that I experience right now, where is that? Where am I? Where is attention, right? Attention, turning the camera on itself, right? Because what happens is it's like you're looking for yourself and there's a semicircle spreading from the edges of your temple out encompassing the world. And when you do inquiry, what happens is, is that you look, you scan all around the semicircle, you stop at the edges. You don't look, actually look where you need, you need to look because that is uh, against your desires, essentially. There's a part of it that doesn't want the illusion broken, you might say. You know? well, where you say that? I remember, I've been doing this for quite a while. Uh -huh. Last time I asked you, you said, you know, maybe you have reached the, you have to change your pattern. You, you, have, you might have reached the plateau. And I think that last year when I was in the walking or something, you said, mm -hmm. if you continue like this, you're going to be there only. You're going to change your approach. Mm -hmm. Okay. See how you're, and that's what you said. Change the way you are looking or change the way you are practicing. But, uh, you know, I, I couldn't, I, I still couldn't do that, meaning mm -hmm. I'm still doing it. But I can I can see that I can I can get better clarity than before as and when I do more and more of this. But then beyond the stage, I have to only surrender. I cannot go beyond. I am waiting for the door to open or something like that. Until it happens, I cannot do it. Say I am at a position where my mind cannot go beyond whatever I am comfortable. Well, your mind, you're right. The mind cannot go beyond a certain point. Um, um, but what what the seekers uh, um, task is, is to bring their mind as close as possible to um, continuity, continuity of attention. Mm -hmm. So, so if we engage in the self inquiry process as close to continuously as possible, and what prevents continuity attachments, mm -hmm. but what destroys attachments as much of this exercise as we can possibly do. Um, so over time, you know, the way my Russian described it, I think, and I agree is, you know, um, what happens is you do this exercise in the process, you start experiencing peace to some extent, you know, blankness or peace, various kinds of terms. That peace is not itself the goal, of course, but the point is you start experiencing some degree of quote unquote, no thought, that is peace. In the process of experiencing the peace, then your mind wants more of it. And as a result, it slowly disengages from its attachments to the outside world and it says, I want more of this easy to acquire inner peace. And it starts to do more of it. As you do more of it, more peace is experienced, fewer attachments, more peace, more practice, fewer attachments, and on and on and on the cycle goes until the attachments are sufficiently weakened. You know, it's like you're, you're, like you're spinning in place at a certain point. You want that point, you know, you want to spin in place at that point long enough. And long enough, eventually, you might say, you know, uh, something, uh, God's grace descends. Something happens. The point is that, that that part is not under your control. That last piece, what is so-called under your control, if we say anything is under your control, is greater continuity of practice. The more, more you do it, you can you see different. Uh, I, I thought I understood as what you said was different perspective of the eyes. When you start doing more and more ways, I come in from. I see if you read it again and again over this or something like that. Keep, it's the same thing. Even you will always say, uh, you know, do it. Say there is what what you, what the real self is only a feeling. There is nothing. Feeling you are the feeling. <coughs> self is a feeling. Everything is a feeling. And that, that's a slogan like that. Sure. Okay. The same thing. So more you when you start focusing on it. For some time, at least, you, you are there like that, you know, but then it comes out of it. You see, it doesn't stay there for a long enough. It could be only still lying only, I don't know, you know, but eventually that, that period of time is increasing, at least I can say. Yeah, look, so, so periods of time in what I would call relative peace, when I say relative peace, I mean a peace that has a duration, you know, extending the period of relative peace is definitely a good thing. But that's, not the but that's not enough, exactly. The point of the relative piece is, it means your mind has become subtle during that, at least during that space of time. And, you know, um, you know, 
as you experience more of it, again, the attachments weaken further and further. But uh, the idea is, like, again, using a, the mirror uh, in a, a different kind of metaphor, is that you're, you're taking a mirror and you're polishing it, you know, and, um, you know, when you ask, for example, who am I, who am I, who am I, and you don't have to use the words, but you can use the words, you don't need to use the words, the words are just a support <laughs> for, uh, for the turning of the attention towards that sense of being. The point is, in the process of doing that, you're polishing the mirror. In a way, when you polish the mirror like that, you're then being presented with the image, the image of peace. This image is like a response to your question. It's like you're asking, who am I? And you're being given this mirror. This is you. You're polishing, but this is you. But what is this? This is, <laughs> this is, it's like, it, you know, it looks like peace, no thought. The key thing is, is, you know, to continuously, at that point, continue the inquiry as much as possible. You cannot go further, I agree, um, without, you know, divine dispensation, but your attempt is to try because we don't want to actually believe that, um, how should I put it? The, the mistake is to think this piece is, in, is in, us. In, it's not actually us, it's a reflection of us. It's a reflection of what we actually are. So you have to ask who's experiencing this piece? Who's experiencing it? When you, when you ask that long enough, continuously, when I think continuously, the point there is, that's what's the continuity of attention that goes into the foundations of our desires and fears and ultimately breaks them down. And that, that's what's required for, uh, you know, um, to permit ourselves, permit ourselves that clarity ultimately will come. Um, but yeah, mm. that lack of control. And it's, it's in a way analogous, you mentioned deep sleep. It's analogous to sleeping because, um, you know, if you try to force yourself to sleep, as anybody who has tried it knows, that actually makes it harder to sleep, you know? You can't force yourself into sleep. What you can do is you can create the um, useful conditions for it, right? So you, you know, you close your eyes and you put yourself in, in a warm bed and you try to be relaxed and, and you allow eventually at some point, unknown to you, sleep will overtake you. Are you sent to Vedanta lecture? In the night, and I call it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, had a, I had a question. Um, so when you say the the reflection, like you keep polishing the mirror, and you you see what you um, um, think is peace, but it's like you said that that's not what what you're actually uh, seeking. Um, is it something like looking at the reflection of the moon in a pool of water? Like they use that analogy of like the chidabhasa. Yeah, is that, yeah. Is that what it is? Sure, you could say so. I mean, yeah, so, so the idea exactly yeah, to, to recognize that the moon is not literally in the water, right? So right. Uh, I, I like using um, um, well, a water reflection analogies actually as well. So, you know, one way of looking at it is, you know, it's as if you have a lake or something like that. And, you know, um, many things are reflected in the lake, right? Mountains, faraway things like, you know, mountains and, you know, clouds and um, trees and whatnot, right? Um, and then there's nearby things that are reflected that, that like, let's say, uh, is you know, your own face, right? So right now, most people, their mind is distributed across many, many, many things on the lake, many, many different reflections, like a thousand and one things. The purpose of the practice is to bring in from those thousand things to one thing, right? Bring it in from the far away things to the nearby things. And ultimately it closes in on a reflection of your face. That reflection of your face, you might say, is the experience of peace. But then you have to go a step further and say, who's seeing this reflection? And you know, at that point, there could be an insight that, oh, this is a reflection of me. That's the critical insight that we want. You know, and if that insight is temporary, it could be temporary. You might call that a, a glimpse of the truth, you know? Um, and if it's permanent, then we call that moksha. So, um, but does that make sense? Yes, yes. Um, can I, can, can, I um, can I just follow up with another question? So, so when you do keep doing this, this inquiry and you go deeper and deeper into this and 
you would, would you reach a point like um, like I'm wondering if this this is part of the of the journey. I reach a point where I become acutely aware of the impermanence of everything, um, literally everything. Um, and then it's a little bit scary at that point. I, I don't know what, where that fear comes from. Yes, of course. No, so I mean, I think you're absolutely, uh, that makes a lot of sense. So, so as you, you know, there are lots of what I would call like, as you mentioned the term glimpse, I like this term as, as, as a kind of experience of uh, when the mind, um, there, I, I, I would say there's like a special state of the mind, right? You could say that's samadhi in a certain sense, but um, when samadhi is entered through these practices, if it's a temporary samadhi into these practices, it's usually coupled with any number of insightful kinds of things. And um, as you approach that zone, um, you know, one of the things you can very well experience is exactly this impermanence of everything, 100%. Everything's a dream, everything is changing, everything's impermanent, all kinds of things could be experienced. Um, uh, other things as well. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that's that state of things are not as they seem, things are not as they seem. And yes, absolutely, it can provoke fear, which is exactly what I'm talking about when I say the parts of yourself that are holding you back from the truth because those parts precisely feel afraid because they're like, well, that means all the things I care about are unreal. So that's scary as a prospect. As you do the practice more and more and more, slowly, 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 or maybe quickly, depending on how intense your practice is, um, the mind learns to trust that fear slowly erodes because as the fear occurs, what you should do is you should immediately subject it itself to inquiry, which is who's experiencing this fear? Who's experiencing this fear? You know, as you bring that into the machinery of inquiry, it will soften. But yes, it's very, um, it would be very um, uh, um, common, basically, I think, if you do inquiry to have a sense of the impermanence of things eventually. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I follow up with another quick question? I mean, this is just a lead into sure, this. Let me just take, let me take um, uh, your question real fast and I'll come back to you. Uh, okay. Go ahead. My question is regarding the self inquiry. Mm -hmm. So when we try to do the self inquiry practice, maybe this, this is how I imagine it. Uh, we tend to, you know, use language and words and things like that to do the inquiry. Sure. Uh, I'm trying to ask you to say, how can I get rid of the language of words or anything like that and still be in the inquiry? Uh, yeah, so um, I think the answer is you'll use the language initially and eventually you won't need it. It's sort of like, it's sort of like um, it will happen automatically is what I mean to say. Just like, for example, I don't know if you're learning, I don't know, learning to ride a bike or something like that. You initially tell yourself like you have to, you know, you, you walk yourself through the process, right? But eventually as you do it, you no longer need the verbal instructions. So similarly, um, this happens in the same way, I would say, you know, because what's really going on again is, you know, I, this is why I use metaphors, but again, the metaphors I'm using are in language, you know, so you know, I can't escape this issue. Um, but uh, but um, uh, try, to, try to really recognize that this is just like turning your attention towards any other part of your experience. I mean, it's different in the sense it's more elusive, but it's similar in the sense that it is, if I said, for example, right now, like feel what your little toe on your right foot feels like right now. You could just do that, but right? you just turn your attention there and suddenly you're aware of it, you know? So similarly, you know, you have this experience of your self somehow and so we're trying to do that and obviously the self is more elusive somehow um that's because it's hiding behind a series of misconceptions but um <laughs> but once you once you really start to recognize that's what's going on um you'll be less reliant on language because what you're trying to do is in every situation recognize the the um the fact of your own being aware of the situation and then 
look for that. Look for you. Look for you. You know, I say look for that. Even that language is misleading, you know. Unfortunately, again, it's an artifact of speaking that it's always misleading in this way. Look for that as if you're looking for something else, but you're not looking for something else. You're looking for you, the looker. You're looking for the looker. Who's the one looking? That's what we're looking for. So, um, you know, it you seems as if, sorry? You look for the silence, man? Uh, no, I wouldn't say you look for the silence. I would say you look for you. Because, for because, because, because you, again, there's this knowledge. What is that knowledge? The silence is silence. You're aware of the silence. Mm. Silence is not you. Mm. So you, who's aware of the silence, where is that? Where's you? <laughs> where are you? <laughs> you right now, where are you? That's the question. Um, okay, now, and you had a further follow-up question, is that right? Uh, like uh, yes, yeah. Sorry, Is a quick... you only, oh, you. Yeah. Oh, me, okay, thanks. Um, so in the very beginning, you mentioned something like I wrote it down, um, that unresolved emotional issues hinder uh, spiritual seeking process, and you talked about psychotherapy. Uh, that could be one one way to um, uh, remove some of these obstacles. Um, so I'm actually uh, uh, training to be a psychotherapist myself, and I was curious and just wondering if you could uh, expand on that a little bit and uh, talk a little bit about what are the kinds of uh, emotional obstacles that, I mean, of course, there's, there's a bunch of them, but I'm looking for some of the subtle ones that we tend to miss um, that that could be that where psychotherapy could be used to tease tease it out and you know uh, yeah there's a lot and it's very complicated. I mean I have I have certain <laughs> I have certain biases on um, the kinds of therapy that I like I'm I'm a big proponent of what um, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to limit my answer a little bit here because what I want to do, I, I'm going to answer your question um, in a limited format. I can come back to it later, but I would like to um, get to surrender and then we'll come back. We'll swing back around. But I will say um, briefly that I'm a big fan of psychoanalysis in particular, which is a form of psychotherapy that deals with the predominant focus on the unconscious. And um, the way I see it is uh, basically, you know, there are things going on um, in the background um, that are often derived from childhood, uh, not necessarily just childhood, but uh, often from childhood, um, that, uh, that we conceal from ourselves and that condition, that condition us, um, that condition our the way we look at reality, the condition the way that we react, relate to other people. It, it, it could be all kinds of things. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, Someone might, for example, be um, have an internal belief that uh, that uh, to enjoy themselves is bad. They've learned this belief in childhood, right? Enjoyment is bad. That in order to be a good person, one must suffer, right? This could be something which could be limiting them in a lot of different ways in their normal life. And it could also be limiting them in the spiritual search because for a number of reasons, what happens is, is there may be a part of themselves that is seeking to live a fuller life. And there's a part of themselves that is like, no, that's sinful, that's wrong, that's bad, right? And so there's this inner conflict with themselves that they may not even be aware of. So is it directly related to how you are brought up? Yes. A lot of it is, yes. How you're brought up is extremely yeah, important. Because uh, some people are brought up in a very rich surrounding. Yeah. And they don't even think about these things because they take everything for granted. Sure. But uh, at the same time, some people are brought up in a very economically challenged situation. And that is how you start thinking that, uh, <clears throat> okay, that's only good for some people. It's not good for me. Or uh, even yeah. when, even when you grow up, even when you are educated, even when you start earning, and you have money, but at the same time you keep denying yeah. that because that is the way you are. Yeah, yeah. I think I think you're you're bringing it up perfectly. Exactly. So 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 certain beliefs that um that and certain ways of looking at the world, in fact, that may have been necessary or served you when you were very young, let's say. Um, they stay on when you're an adult and they can constrict 
they can constrict all kinds of things basically, but essentially they constrict your energies, you know, because what happens is in a nutshell, you're at war with yourself. You don't know that you're at war with yourself. Um, and, and your energies are locked in a way where you don't recognize what it is that you actually feel, you don't recognize what it is that you actually want. Um, and as a result, what that effectively means is that your mind is agitated in a way that you do not comprehend is even happening. And that limits your ability to concentrate. And concentration is the key to the spiritual. So, so um, th that's just one example. I mean, there are all kinds of other examples, you know, anything from um, specific major traumas people have, but I don't think it has to be major traumas. I think a lot of things happen because people are, um, have conformed in various ways to um, the expectations that have been that have been set forth in their family as they grew up. And, um, and, and, and those things then constrict them. They may not even understand or under, uh, uh, um, realize that they've been constricted. They may not be in touch with their actual emotions. But as a result of not being in touch with their actual emotions, they, they might find it like, like give an example, it doesn't have to be the spiritual even, but like people procrastinate all the time. And they say, why am I procrastinating? Like, I know I should be doing, I know I should be getting up for a run in the morning, but I don't. I, you know, I know I should be eating better, but I don't. I know I should be doing this in my career, but I don't. Well, often the reason that happens is because people are deceiving themselves about what they actually want and what they actually feel. And they may not even realize that this is happening, but this is happening in the background. And this affects the spiritual just as much as it affects anything else. So to sort of like, slowly unwind this tangled web, you know, um, is I think one of the things therapy can do. And also I should say, I really shouldn't, I shouldn't make the second because I feel like it's maybe even more important than what I just said. Um, I think the therapy, uh, there's a very, very powerful element of um, a certain kind of nurturing relationship, you know, that many people uh, have not gotten to experience in full, kind of non-judgmental relationship. Um, and that can be very healing for many people. Uh, uh, frankly, honestly, if I may be totally frank, I, I feel like I, I, would, I would pretty much unreservedly recommend um, that serious seekers get therapy, honestly, because mm -hmm. it's not just about major problems. There are many minor things that can happen in people that they don't realize um, that can be help through this process. Not to say that every therapy is good, it's definitely not. Um, not to say that every process is super successful, it isn't. But to recognize that um, emotional issues are rife through the, you know, through the spiritual process. And um, if you're a serious seeker and you wanna use every tool at your disposal, I would say, why not? You know, um, there are ways of, of getting it. Um, there are ways of affording it. Um, you know, <laughs> why not? And this is a, mo a tool that the modern world really offers. Move. So <laughs> anyway, I, I will come back to that later, but I, I hope that was at least a brief answer to your question. Um, I, I oh, yes, it does. Yes, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Could I, this is Vidya. Can I just ask a quick question? Sure. So, um, you know, so what I'm gathering is this process of self-inquiry, self you know, it is definitely, you know, the more you give, the more you get, you know, the more you um, go through the cleansing process. And one of the states you experience is the, sil you know, maybe the silencing of the mind, which is not the real thing, but at least that's a stage. So if, you know, just um, as one could use therapy to uh, get out of some of the emotional entanglements, then is, you know, the other meditative practices or mindfulness practices, which all lead to that state of silence, you know, can that also serve as a complementary to, is, is, other, is the silent state we are talking about the same as one would get from, say, a mindfulness or meditation practice or even, you know, running or yoga practice or whatever versus the silence one would experience, you know, as you go through the inquiry process. Because if someone is very action oriented and they want more in terms of activity to reach the same state versus contemplation, I was just curious about whether you could 
comment more on that state of silence and then um, eventual progression. Yeah, so I mean, just to be clear, right? So um, silence, again, in itself is, I mean, it, it's a good thing, um, but, you know, it's obviously not the final goal. Um, you know, even <laughs> what I'm talking about in terms of emotional issues is not necessarily cured just by periods of silence, because people routinely go, for example, to uh, retreats, okay? Um, and they might do mindfulness meditation or something like that for several days. I'm not gonna say it's, it's not a good thing. It may help them to a certain extent, but um, that period of, 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 of silence that they might experience um, doesn't necessarily cure them of more profound emotional issues that they're experiencing. So let's be clear that, that the silence you experience one way or the other, um, is not in and of itself um, necessarily wholly curative of emotional issues. I'll just say any more than it's wholly curative of physical issues, right? So in the Gita, for example, it said, you know, a seeker should not sleep too much or too little, should not eat too much or too little. So the recognition that there is a physical element, uh, however minor, to the seeking process, that one should keep the body in some modicum of balance if one is to seek. Okay. Similarly, I would say the emotional side is the same thing. Um, now that said, um, are other practices like mindfulness, yoga, running, etc., could they be helpful for someone? Yes, they could. Now, the preference is always, if you have a choice and if you're willing and able, is always to do surrender or inquiry as the number one priority. That is, that is always superior to everything else. And everything else can happen or not as it will. Um, but what happens is. If you cannot do surrender or inquiry for whatever reason, then it becomes wise to step down to whatever practice it is that you can do. You know, it could be karma yoga, it could be running in a certain kind of way, uh, it could be, um, you know, and, and, and the truth is, you know, that running and yoga are, are really not contradictory to inquiry. You know, there is, there's, there's two ways of looking at this, you know, when you do inquiry, if you do it during daily life, it does not necessarily mean <laughs> that the body and the mind stop functioning. They can function. And uh, what they do, uh, if you're doing inquiry, may not much matter to you, and that's hopefully the case, but um, whatever they do uh, could include running or yoga. But what happens is if you can't do inquiry, uh, meaning if you can't focus on that as your main priority, then you can deliberately take the focus away and put the focus on whatever else, other activity is that does help you because ultimately you have to do what will help you at whatever stage you're at, you know, um, and, and go move towards, uh, Maharishi said once, you know, by whatever means possible, attain, you know, concentration, basically. So whatever means that will help you towards that, you know, go towards it. Um, and, you know, yes, of course, inquiry and surrender are most preferable, but if you have to walk up a certain ladder to get there and walk up that ladder, 100%. And when um, you're talking about silence, okay, you don't talk to anybody, you sit down and you are silent. But if you, if you think you can't keep going back and forth, back and forth, what good is that silence? Well, yeah, so you're not trying to. Physical silence. Yeah, we are talking about mental silence. You mean mental silence. So the mental silence, that's certainly a good thing. There's no question about it. Um, you know, well, mind doesn't even stop one second without a thought. <laughs> I, I, that's true. Well, that's, that's because the, the, the mental silence is itself a kind of thought, you know? Um, yeah. But um, yeah, does that, does that make sense? Yep. Okay, great. Okay, good. So, um, all right, so let's go into surrender now. Uh, and, uh, and we'll see how, how this seems to be similar to and different from inquiry. So the way I like to explain surrender is um, imagine everything that you're seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling, and everything that you're thinking and feeling is just on a TV. And your job is not to turn the TV off, is not to change the channel on the TV. It's not to say that everything on the TV is great or wonderful or perfect or accepted or have any kind of particular emotion towards it. 
It's merely to recognize it's just a TV. And essentially, um, <laughs> I can't use this word, I'm gonna explain it though a little further, um, is ignore it. Just ignore the TV, just ignore the TV. So when I say ignore it, a lot of people have a misconception that again, you have to like force out thoughts. You don't have to force anything out. Allow everything in. When I say ignore, what I mean is you are constantly attempting to recognize that whatever is happening, whatever is happening is just a thought. Whatever is happening is just a thought. And that is, that's what it means to um, ignore it. Ignoring means you do not permit your attention to become absorbed in something. You continuously revoke your attention. It's a continuous, when I say continuous, I mean it's happening over and over again. Every second, like every second, you're being presented with a beautiful picture in front of you. Or maybe it's, a, maybe it's not so beautiful picture, but either way, it's an absorbing picture. It's a picture that wants to draw your attention into it and mesmerize you. Your goal is every time this happens, which is literally every second, to recognize uh, this is another mesmerizing picture and wake yourself up from the dream that it's trying to put you into. The other side of this, uh, other side of this uh, part of this instruction is um, about willpower. This is actually exactly the same as the first instruction, <laughs> but I'm gonna, I, I like to separate it out because it's helpful. Um, so by willpower, what I mean is, that sense that you have of doing something like in this, like, which feels like I am doing it. Like that's the, the sense of I have to keep <clears throat> my attention, my focus, I have to focus on, I have to use that sort of muscle, inner muscle and, 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 and make it happen, you know, essentially. It could be something very small or it could be something very large, but that sense that you have of that, that kind of inner muscle, that muscle, should be relaxed for everything except the practice itself, except the practice itself. So you do use your willpower for one thing and one thing alone, which is to vigilantly watch and make sure that you are not absorbed in anything that's going on. And this requires a continuous effort, a continuous, like, um, like uh, reawakening. It's not like it's not like it's not like one thing. It's like it's like flickering, you know, over and over and over and over again. Re recognize, re 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 recognizing that this too is irrelevant. It's basically all white noise. That's what surrender is. Surrender is. Uh, I use this, I use a metaphor earlier today, but I like it because I think it resonates. You know, it's as if you are like royalty. Okay, you're royalty and you're sitting on a throne and your job is not to do anything, basically, right? Royalty doesn't do anything. Other people do things for them. But imagine you're surrounded by voices that are trying to trick you into getting down from the throne and doing things that a uh, king or queen doesn't have to do. So your job is merely to protect, protect your royal status. And there be a lot of voices that are trying to threaten you or tempt you various ways. You have to do this, no, you have to do that, or else, or else, right? Um, or, or don't you want this? You know, those kinds of voices basically are trying to get you off the throne. You just have to say, this is all irrelevant, 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 irrelevant. And, and, and protect your, um, it's, like, it, it's, like a, it's like a fortress, basically. There's a fortress, you're sitting inside it, and this fortress is under constant attack by thought. The thought is trying to deceive you into believing that something is important. But in fact, nothing is important. Nothing except protecting the fortress. So your job is all your attention, protecting the fortress at all times, hypervigilant, hypervigilant. This is true of inquiry too, actually. But um, you basically ignore everything, do not use your effort. And in that state of relaxation, you know, you're keeping yourself relaxed, except you're doing it vigilantly. <laughs> so, so there is effort involved. There is, don't, don't be very clear, even though it's called surrender, for a long time, effort will be required. 
effort will be required because it's something like you've gone through life with your fist clenched like this, okay? And if I say, just relax your fist, it's so much nicer, right? It will require continuous effort to remember to keep unrelaxing, or relaxing, I should say, relaxing, unclenching your fist because you've been habitually accustomed to keeping it like this, yeah. you know? So the effort has to be required until it becomes second nature to keep it relaxed, which will happen eventually. But, um, but that's surrender. So as you just surrender, um, uh, will we'll happen. I mean, uh, I, I want to ask one thing before I say anything else, which is, um, does anyone see any parallel so far between surrender and inquiry? The way I've described it. In the way you observe, yeah. uh, a lot of what's going around you, and you observe a of law. Yes. So, 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 what are you doing in surrender? And maybe you should do this after. You should do this after the practice. But I'll, that's okay. I'll I'll now. No, I'm sorry. They're the same. But in both both cases, if we so here also in surrender, also you are not the doer. Somebody is doing the work for you. Yeah, that that sure. That's that that's a certain kind of comparison. Um, but you know, it's an in inquiry, right? You're looking for you're looking for yourself, right? In surrender. You're not explicitly looking for yourself, right? But what are you doing? What are you doing to the world? What are you doing to the world? Ignoring. You're ignoring it, right? So when you ignore it, you're taking your attention away from the world. And by world, we also include all your inner thoughts and feelings, by the way. That's an internal world. You're moving your attention away from objects. When you move your attention away from objects, Two words, what must you necessarily mean it to? Is it when you start, when you stop uh, thinking about objects, then you stop and start thinking about people. So well, it's either it's it's an object or form. And those are the two things you're always thinking about. Right, right. Well, so, but, but people would also be objects, right? Yeah. So, so in my yeah, opinion, this idea of surrender, people are Very also similar to cultivating what's called a Sakshi Bhava, the sense of a witness. So you know, in one case you're only observing the other one. In the other case you're you're not only you're also cultivating sakshi bhava, but you're also wondering who who is the, who is witnessing everything. Yes. So, so, so inquiry. That, that, that's in the right direction. So 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 um. So let I, let I, me give my 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 I, thoughts about the question about this. My name is Sri Krishna, and uh, I think in the earlier stage when you are witnessing. Uh, basically, our attachments to the thoughts minimize, and our focus on the seer gets more closer or intense. In the process of comparison, actually now we started surrendering to this seer rather than the scene. So in that yeah. way, it's, it's pretty parallel. Right, right. So exactly. actually, as as we get closer to the seer, the world of our expands per se. And we don't give any importance to any particular part of the world. Yeah, right. Every, everything becomes inclusive. We embrace everything. We don't exclude anything. That's so, right. So our personality becomes more embracing or expansive. And the surrender basically does the same thing because now we become, uh, we, we, we are tolerating every nuisance in the world under the, we don't give too much importance to that because it is our own creation. It's our own uh, uh, objects. So we don't give importance to the objects. We give importance to our being, our awareness, our uh, inner self. That's my attempt to analyze this too. Yes. So, so I mean, I, I, I want to, um... Uh, I want to say a couple of things about what you just said. So, so one is to be clear, right? When you are in the process of surrender, when you're attempting to surrender anyway, because the truth is just like the end of self-inquiry, uh, the, fi the finality of self-inquiry has to be given by God's grace. Similarly, complete surrender is also a product of God's grace. Mm -hmm. But um, in the attempt to surrender, uh, just like with inquiry, 
it doesn't mean that the mind and the body stop functioning. And um, uh, the importance of saying that, um, that for example, that, that you don't have to change the channel on the TV is that when the mind and the body function, it can very well be reacting to situations. Mm -hmm. It can react to situations without you. And those reactions might be what people consider to be negative. So you might feel anxiety or fear or anger or depression, and the body might react in ways that are that comport with those things. That's not a problem. The problem, we are not striving necessarily to get rid of all negative emotions, although that may happen or negative emotions may weaken as attachments weaken, that's a separate issue. But, um, but the point is in surrender is to recognize that whatever emotions do occur and whatever actions do occur are not us and are not real. And therefore, uh, we don't want to identify with them. That the non-identification means that we are recognizing it as just a thought. It's just a thought, whatever it is, whatever it is. Um, uh, that said, I, I do want to uh, agree with you on what you said about the yeah. seer and the seen, exactly. Because what happens is, is when you do inquiry, you are hunting for I, for yourself. In the process, objects are ignored. Just like in that mirror example, right? You look at the shining surface of the mirror, the objects are ignored in that process. Hmm. And you're, you're ignoring the objects. You're revoking your attention from them, continuously revoking your attention. As you revoke your attention, there's only one place, one direction the attention can then go, which is towards the seer, which is towards I, basically. Yeah. So as you ignore progressively, um, what will happen is, just like an inquiry, um, the mind, mind's attachments will weaken and the process, the mind will get subtler and, um, you know, the, um, the eye towards which you're going will also become subtler, subtler and subtler and subtler. And so in inquiry, you're hunting the eye directly, you may you're forward in a forward direction, you might say, and in surrender, you're sort of walking backwards into it. You might say, you might think of it that way, but mm -hmm. there is definitely a parallel. So, yes, 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 exactly. You're walking, yes, exactly. You're walking backwards into it precisely. Exactly, that's not my circle. Exactly. So, so, uh, so if you draw a parallel between the traditional path of Viveka and Vairagya, and using Viveka to distinguish between what's impermanent and then always staying, recognizing, recognizing what your nature as being permanent, that whole practice, and then putting effortful vairagya and then dropping into paravairagya, which is an automatic, you know, state where you're detached. Isn't there a lot of parallel between the two, or is there a, a subtle difference there? Um, I use I use viveka to basically reject everything that's not real. That yes. seems like very close to surrender. Well, yes, sure. So, but um, um, in this definition, yeah. there's a. See, uh, yes, concepts like this is all unreal are helpful adjuncts to surrender. Um, just like they're helpful adjuncts or aids to inquiry. Um, but we should be clear that real Viveka, i.e. real discernment is a product of uh, the practice. Because what happens is, is when you surrender, okay, uh, we should really just practice it. <laughs> I'm going to say practice it in a second, but I will say one thing before, before we do that is, um, is uh, as you surrender, what, you will, what will happen is you will start to recognize that things that you didn't recognize were thoughts are thoughts. Like, oh, oh, this is a thought. See, what happens is we're trying to surrender. In the process of trying to surrender, we recognize X, Y, Z as things that are that are just thoughts. And we try not to be influenced by them. But meanwhile, we're being, still being influenced by A, B, C, and D. We don't recognize that because we believe, we don't realize that this is happening, but we believe we are A, B, and C, and D. So therefore we don't look at them. We just look at X, Y, and Z. Eventually A comes to our attention. I'm like, oh, A is also here. I should ignore that as well. You know, then B comes to our mind. And so that's the process of like the, taking the layers off the onion, 
you know, because these progressive identification, we don't even know, we don't even know that we're, that we're identifying until we see the identification. So um, that process is what real Vedika is. The, the, um, the sort of um, uh, um, uh, conceptual statements of I'm not the body, I'm not the mind, et cetera, are aids to that, basically. But fundamentally, each person in a way is their own little puzzle. You know, they, we all have our own set of assumptions and we have to peel them away. Because what's happening is it's like, a, think about like an old fashioned um, slide projector. You know, they have the transparencies on it, right? So imagine you have a stack of 50 such transparencies, right? What you're trying to do is you're trying to take them off one by one to get to the light underneath. That's what's trying to, in some sense, we're trying to do. So um, does that make sense? No. Okay. So right. let's let's practice surrender. I want it exactly the same way. So basically, what I want you to do is uh, sit, preferably eyes open, but you can keep your eyes closed if you really want to, um, and just try to ignore, I could say ignore all thought, or you could say ignore everything. It really comes to the same thing because everything is a thought. Um, but continuously ignore, right? And keep yourself in this vigilant state of ignoring and relax your willpower. I mean, not that there's really anything to do right this particular second, but relax your willpower. Um, and just try that and let's see what the experience is. I'll set a five minute timer. So here we go.
All right. Anyone want to share their experience? <clears throat> Go ahead. So I was uh, trying to observe my thoughts during the session of five minutes. Mm -hmm. And there were so many thoughts coming to my mind. And I really like the analogy that you explained that how we need to uh, protect our uh, royal fortress as a king or queen uh, in the middle of all, hearing all these voices. But my, my doubt or whatever the observation, I can, this is nothing but like a, as a spectator, how can I train my mind to watch the thoughts coming as an actor in a play? and be detached from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, there are, in, um, in the, among these voices, there are some duties still I have to perform them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do I differentiate and how do I balance between these two? Gotcha, right. So this is a common, um, <laughs> common question. The answer is, you don't. So <laughs> the answer is, duty is no more privileged than anything else. See. Duty, in fact, is a big obstacle for seekers. Um, people are attached to duty, it's a huge problem. So you have to recognize that one feels a sense of duty because one is identified with the person. That you're not a person, actually. And, um, and uh, uh, you know, this idea of trying to juggle multiple balls, never try to juggle. You're trying to do one thing and one thing alone. Inquiry or surrender, everything else can, you know, deal with itself, basically, you know? So, so whether the duty happens or doesn't happen, you know, Maharishi says, if there's a piece of karma that you are fated to perform, don't worry, you shall perform it, like it or not, it will happen. And if there's something which you are not fated to perform, you can run after it all you like, you will never catch it. So you can be assured that anything which is meant to happen will happen, whether you like it or not, you don't need to worry about it. So your task is, there's no duty for you. Duty, duty is, this is, see, surrender is, surrender is really just in a way um, uh, you are, um, we're jumping, we're jumping to the truth. That's, that's essentially what's going on here. But the truth is that, that what you actually are, Brahman, the self, is duty free. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> it comes to <laughs> Talking to people, yeah. we are married. We have one. So, 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 so,
of Prahlada, you know, Prahlada was extremely devout, you know, and um, uh, at a certain point, you know, he realizes the self and he sits down and he falls into Samadhi, okay? So it said that when he falls into Samadhi, you know, he's the king of the Asharas. So when the king is at peace, the subjects are said to be at peace. So when Prahlada is in Samadhi, all his Asharas all fall into Samadhi. The problem is uh, which person we're talking pra about. Pra 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 so the thing is, the, the devas are there to fight the asharas. So when all the demons are at peace, the gods have nothing to do. So they too <laughs> fall into samadhi. Okay, they all fall into samadhi, and the humans are the pawns of the gods and the demons. So. They all fall into samadhi. The gods and the demons are in samadhi. The humans fall into samadhi. And at this point, Vishnu intervenes. And he says, this is going to cause the end of the world too early. Too early. It's not meant to end yet. So he goes to Pralada and he, he wakes him up. And he says, you have to go on performing your duties as king of the demons. But you will do them as, as if a baby half asleep. You will not be affected by them. They will just occur. You're the instrument, that's it. So, so the reality is everything, can, and we know this too. We know this from our own experience, at least once in our lives, most likely, maybe multiple times. I'm sure there have been times in our life, uh, often it's when playing music or doing something creative or doing something when we are skilled at it, um, where there are these moments where we have moments of effortless action, right? We can do things that are incredibly complicated, but it feels as if we are in a dream that just occurring. The truth is, this is always the case, whether we feel it to be the case or not. This alone is the case. Everything's happening exactly like that. Whether we feel it to be the case or not is a matter of mind state, but, um, but that's the truth. So everything can go on. And again, you know, Maharishi cites, you know, um, Gandhi at this point. You know, Gandhi says at one point, he writes a letter to a friend. He says, you know, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know anything, but somehow things are going on. This is at the height of his activity, you know? No. So he says, and nor do I need to know what's going on. Maybe, no. maybe my own plan is an interference with God's plan for me. So it's completely possible, yeah. is the answer. Yeah. But, um, but of course, it feels like it isn't. See, that's the problem. So, you know, the reality is, you know, we, we, have, um, we have real reality is it more or less. I mean, even though I'm going to say, of course, it's a concept, so it's not exactly true, but it's pretty close to true that we have no control, individual control. Anything that is to happen yes, will happen exactly. whether you sit quietly or whether you that's right. That's, right. that's right. It's well known. Yeah. So, you know, there's a railroad track. That railroad track is designed by God. And this is said, and it's said in the Gita too. It's, it's, I just love this. It's hilarious, right? Because all this time, Krishna has been trying to persuade Arjuna to fight, mm -hmm. right? Then the 18th chapter, he says, okay, I've given you all this information. Now you decide whether to fight or not. Do whatever you want. But then he says, but know this. If in your delusion, you think you're going to choose not to fight, let me tell you, you're wrong. Because you are going to fight. Yes. That's your nature. And I'll tell you, the real truth is, you're just like a piece on a machine. Yeah. And, and God fits the machine. Yeah. And you move along with it. Yeah. You don't actually have any control. This is the whole, the whole thing has been a kind of uh, yeah, you know, no, drama, no, you know, a farce. Yeah. There's no actual individual control. No. He says it very clearly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, so this is the case. So, so, so we can let things go if we, if we can cultivate the faith in that. And the very practice of surrender will itself cultivate that faith in the end, you know. So this is beyond karma yoga, actually. Right? Yeah. It's beyond karma yoga. Yeah. Beyond Both karma. self inquiry and surrender are beyond karma yoga because. In karma yoga, you you still embrace in some sense your duties and your set. You know, you you do you actively do. I mean, try to say I'm not going to be concerned with the results, and tell yourself I'm not really the doer. You have certain attitudes, but in inquiry and surrender, you don't have certain attitudes. You yes. are trying to get away from attitudes at all. You're trying to get away from thoughts at all. It's very hard. <laughs> It's hard, of course. But, uh, yes. it's you, you will feel it. In, like, yeah. you, you will feel it. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but please talk. Yeah. Again, um, I didn't have too many thoughts. Uh -huh. uh, I had only three. Mm -hmm. Because I could count them. Um, one was that you know, I could smell the food. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> the second part was okay, I needed to do something. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. The third part was a little amusing. The sense that the day I was sitting, 
But what about the dark? I'm sitting like my face. Huh. And I said, that's how, that's how, so very obvious. You know, how can I even think that I'm sitting like a Maharishi? <laughs> 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 you know, you know, you know, you know, you know. See, that's how we delude ourselves every moment. Yeah. Now, kind of, you know, that's fine. So the, the point is, right? Our position, it's not our, it's not our role to judge our thoughts and feelings mm -hmm. as acceptable or unacceptable. We don't have to say this is good and this is bad. Yeah. You don't have to say it. Just notice that this is not you. That's it. That's all that matters, right? We, have, we can permit all kinds of thoughts. You know, it doesn't matter. Thoughts and feelings um, that are, uh, you know, uh, we, we may not like to think that we have, but we may have them. Greed or anger or lust or whatever it is, right? Those things may pass through. That's not the problem in itself. Problem is not the thoughts or feelings themselves. The problem is identification with them, which means that we take them seriously. We believe they're us. We believe we have to act on them, and we put effort towards them. And the whole practice surrender is just to cut that, basically. So, um, <coughs> yeah. So maybe I can ask you. I mean, uh, yeah, no, right. a little bit uh, again more on this uh, the action part, right? So, so let's say there's food, like uh -huh. does he smell food, uh -huh. and then there's a thought that I'm hungry. Uh -huh. Now I can reject both these thoughts and then I can starve myself of food, maybe, you know, or keep rejecting thoughts and not act to go and eat food. And yet there is a need to act and, you know, so would the, would the you know, act to go and have, eat the food happen on its own accord without my agency in it? Uh, is that sort of what you're leading to? Because things have to go on, right? I mean, the, everything has to. So, has to so, happen. so it is, the way I put it is, um, it's perfectly capable of going on without you. It's perfectly capable of going on without you. Um, now, what happens is, is that it's like, um, uh, <laughs> the mind doesn't comprehend how it can happen though, you see? Yeah. So it's like looking, it's like looking. Uh, When's it gonna happen? When's it gonna uh, happen, right? And, and it doesn't happen while you're looking. Actually, actually truth is it can happen even while you're looking. Right? I should, I should, I should amend what I'm saying, but, but, but what happens is, you know, um, uh, technically speaking, probably the mind, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, wavers in a moment. And that's what, that's what, that's what happens. But um, <clears throat> you don't have to do anything. Whatever will happen will happen, and it will happen uh, 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 in a way that when it happens. It's never going to be quite explicable how it happens because the way the way that things happen is ultimately rooted in mystery. I see. You see, so um, uh, because yeah, because the mind doesn't understand. Like yeah, how can it happen? Like don't I need to go get the food? I see. See, and so and so, you just hold your hands and say, I I'm not putting any effort towards it. I'm not saying. See, at the same uh, time, nor are you preventing yourself. Oh, you're from preventing it, right? It, right? You're just saying I'm not going to put any effort into it. I what feels like me. Will not put any effort towards it. Right, right, right. And now, if you treat something. yourself like 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 somebody else, right? So like like if like if Akulesh were ten feet over there, well, he can go get the food uh -huh. if he wants to. I'm I'm not going to get the food. He can get it. I have no problem. He can do whatever he wants. In fact, but I'm not going to do anything. Yeah, yeah. So Maybe. so things will things will happen. Now whatever happens. Now the thing is, you can't um, put any conditions on what will happen. Right, right. You don't uh, can't put any conditions what will happen, when it will happen, how it will happen. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, even now that's the case. Even now that's the case. It's already the case that you have no control. So there's only illusion of control that we're trying to break that illusion. It's an illusion. It's wow. like we eat food, and once it goes into the stomach, it's not in our hands. Yeah. Wow. It gets digested. Yeah, yeah right. Whether yeah, you right. like it, yeah. it gets digested. Sure. Sure. And it gets eliminated yes. the next day. Yes. You have no control over yes. it. Yes, 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 exactly, exactly. But, 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 but this is a very, very profound because everything, including me walking to the car to go to work, everything is happening on its own accord. And I have, so it, it you know, that's what you're saying yes. would happen. Yes. How it happens. Yes, yes, and, yes. And even for you to want it to happen a certain way is, you know, it's not part of it, but it happens. Yes. Now, again, right? Yes, it's one hundred percent true. I mean, the the, the no, no, but I stopped thinking when I'm doing it when I practice what he's saying. 
I should not think of that, that thought. I should reject all those thoughts. Right. I, the thoughts can come. It's just so, a, yeah, right. thoughts come and right. I just, right. you're, just, you're just trying to say, I, my, but then there's some other agency mind. that makes me get up, walk towards the car, and drive. Sure. Okay. Sure. Sure. Or it may not. The thing is, okay. you or, should, it may not. or it may not. Right. So whatever happens, happens. You should be prepared for any possibility because it might be the case that when you try surrender, you're just sitting there for a while. You're like, well, this isn't working. No, wrong. That means your surrender is imperfect. Because you have an expectation that, oh, I'm going to surrender and things will be exactly as they were before. Maybe yeah, that will yeah. be the case and maybe it will not be. So, so, so. Um, because what we are saying is this surrender should be mental and intellectual surrender, not the consumer surrender. Uh, it, it, should, it should be, it should be non use of your, your personal effort. It's a little bit different from karma yoga. Does that make sense? So I want to go back to the point that you mentioned about the excellence happens effortlessly when Yeah, well, that's right. That's a certain like we're talking about certain skills. I was just giving that as an example of, you know, um, uh, he was asking about. Well, is it possible that one can rule a kingdom or something like that, right? And if I say, well, yeah, you can do very, we have proof in our own lives that very complicated, creative, intellectual activities can happen while we feel sure. as if we are not doing anything at all. True. That's so, all. The question that I had is, uh, is that a result of a culmination of preparation? Yes. Like previous yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, yes, yes. That, in a particular skill domain, yes, the feeling of profound effortlessness is usually a culmination of prior effort. Um, but my point there simply is that that state that that state is even possible is proof that uh, such complicated activities can go on without us. You know, like so so um, just to show that well, it, it's not the case that. We are really needed the way that we think we are. You know, you're right. That is a in our normal experience, it's limited to a particular skill. It's true that for which we have done prior mm -hmm. effort. So it's not a perfect analogy, but it's the best we have essentially. Um, and ultimately, this is the very same thing is you know uh, this same effort of effort effortlessness is is um, exactly what we're striving. For in the practice in a way, right? Because when you do the practice itself long enough with effort, then in the end it shall become effortless. Uh, is this a quick fact? Sure, sure. Going back to the Prahlada. So, apparently, there was a conversation between Prahlada and Nityananda. And who did that? Uh, Nityananda. So, oh. who came into his kingdom? Okay. Nityananda. Oh, Nityananda. Nityananda. And then he said, Nityananda is supposed to have been to the prayer. Okay. So Prahlada basically is wondering how could you be a Siddha Prajna? So to which he says, if I get food and eat, if I don't get food and just talk, if I have a place to have a good mattress and this and that, I'll sleep on that. If I don't have it, I'll just sleep on the floor. Uh -huh. So to me, I think matter. Uh, my mind is still uh, I don't waver, meaning I only will have this or not that. Whatever that happens, it happens. I just go through the water. So, so anyway, in this is the thing, uh, the concept of Siddha Prajna, where you accept everything equally, <coughs> so to speak. Whether something happens good for you, you accept it. If something doesn't happen good in years and so on. This thing, you accept that too. So I just want to kind of uh, get your thought on it. Yeah, see, I would say, um, how should I put this? Um, Really accepting everything truly means accepting your internal reactions to everything as well. And those internal reactions can be negative. So the real Siddha Pragna is the one for whom uh, even non acceptance is, is in some sense accepted. Yeah. You know, like Maharishi says, you know. Yeah, wait, I, should, I should preface this by saying, right, this very concept of a Siddha Pragna or Jnani is problematic because, because in the end, 
the insight that we have that that that, that um the, that the truth about the self. The studio is not. Oh, that is connected. Connected. Power. It's a little bit. Mm -hmm. We will hear you fine. No problem. Oh. I know, oh, no, no, no. It is because low power uh, the thing came. Yeah, now it's fine. Yeah, it's fine now. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I was yeah. gonna say, right? So, so, so the concept of the Siddha Pragna or Nyani in a way is itself a little problematic because the insight that we're looking for, in a sense, is disidentification with the body or the fact of of I am not the body, I am not the mind. Right. So the question is, what would it mean for a person to be a Nyani? A person to be nyani when the when the nyana is I'm not the person, right? So there's anyway. So but with that in mind, you see, I, I want to distinguish between therefore um, external actions and external displays of what a person might feel, and whether or not there is an internal disidentification. One cannot necessarily be told from the other. So Maharishi says, you know, there may be people who are Nyanis, but have seemingly very, at least from a so called external point of view, very like logic qualities, you know? So anything can happen, you know? It's, it's you know, just like, I mean, this is why you have in, in our mythology, you know, um, you know, uh, Ravana is, you know, a, one of what Vishnu's attendants or something like that, you know, be born. All kinds of demons are actually not what they seem to be. So um, everyone is playing a role in a cosmic drama, and, and the ultimate, the ultimate truth is not what it seems. So, so I would say, you know, it's a um, the real attachment is that the real attachment is the attachment that permits play of all possible actions and emotions, not necessarily that um, one must be quote unquote literally indifferent. There may be such people who are literally indifferent. You know, it said in the Gita, yeah, you know, the the, the, the Nyani, you know, is feels the same toward. Gold and peace, or something like that. You know, what does that mean? Does that mean that they really? Literally, must treat everything exactly the same. What does that mean? What it really means is there's a recognition that all of this is my. Yes. That's okay. That's okay because 
I was, I was just giving this example earlier. You know, um, uh, you know, this example where where uh, Yeah, you know, and you know, uh, he's telling me, he was talking about that, you know, how it was just an illusion, and then that elephant comes charging, you know, and the, the guru runs away. And the, the student says, well, didn't you say, well, it was an illusion, why did you run away? And they said, well, it was an illusion, the elephant is an illusion, and my running away was also an illusion. <laughs> so we have to be consistent, you know, we can't make these contexts in a long way. So people think, oh, yeah, you know, it's all the same. So poison is the same as nectar. No, it's not. I've been a relative sense. We're operating in relative sense, there's differences, you know, but It's not an absolute rule. So, um, you know, uh, yeah, you know, someone who is um, someone who undergoes, uh, you know, um, uh, a trial, if they, you know, a, some kind of difficulty, if they, if they uh, have a very quiet mind, it may roll off their back, you know, uh, in a mental sense. Not a purely spiritual sense. They may not feel the same emotions that other people feel. That's possible. But the point is, even if they do feel those emotions, that does not necessarily negate spiritual knowledge. It's not the same thing. So you have again examples of you know Mahabharata. I think it's Mahabharata. You have you know, I believe it's Mahabharata. Um, Vashishta, right? So Vashishta um, loses a hundred of the hundred and one sons to some demon that eats them. Okay, and he is. Though he is obviously, you know, highest yami, um, seems to become highly depressed, suicidal. And he tries to kill himself in various ways. He tries to throw himself off a cliff and he tries to burn himself and whatnot. And it said that, you know, because of who he was, you know, the river refused to drown him. The ground refused to hurt him. The king's soft, right? The fire refused to burn him, right? They wouldn't, so he couldn't do it. But um, the point is, you can always experience profound pain, emotional pain. Um, but that's a necessary. Is that like a recent accident? <laughs> Which the recent down here in devils flying? Oh. They couldn't be killed. <laughs> So yeah, so the beginning about that. What's the difference between two basic points? One point is that at least right now, obvious way to explain. Okay. Produces, you show one another. 
um, an artifact of the fact that you know, we never have these identity ideas matter. Materialism is a consensus among the soul. It's actually problematic. Um, yeah. So I think we have, philosophically now, nor could it ever be explained. That's the case. First minute, Saul and I, I lose my consciousness. Sure. I'm in a hospital as so called not liberated station, not of their brain. Does anything else remain there? No, no, you, you, you have a serious problem because the problem, like all questions, real questions about experience, okay? If you ask me that question, what I would have to do, really, if I'm yeah. going to really answer that question, is ask, okay, my experience, who am I? Sure. In that very inquiry, the question unravels itself. So there, there is, there is a, there's a problem with it because there's the very question, the way you put it, I, I'm, I'm arguing in different frames here, right? Because on the one hand, I want to say, Arguing in sort of normal frame reference, uh, you have to you have to hit materialism, which is the basic law. That everything is matter. That's the, that's where this question comes from, you know, in in a sense. Um, but then, from a more quote unquote spiritual so called point of view, if you ask me that question, I have to say I also do self inquiry. But self inquiry plunges the mind into a place where um, uh, it disappears. So that question doesn't exist. That question is premised. The question is premised on assumptions that are false, fundamentally false, because this is true ultimately of all language and all concepts. Everything starts out from, I am a kind of atomic center. And from this atomic center, then there's differentiation into I and not I. And the not I is split up into a bunch of concepts. From that, you get all language, all thinking, all arguments, all questions. But then if you look very, very, very deeply and closely at that I, that I, it turns out the I is not a defined center like that. But the brain has been used to this process. This, the brain is a concept. In, in what way? The brain is a concept. No, 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 so, that's still a concept. Mm -hmm. So, 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 see, there's two completely different uh, 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 ways of investigation if you're used to it, right? If you believe that the only proper mode of investigation is the scientific, uh, then you, you're building on a certain philosophical foundation. Right. The philosophy is materialism. Right. The only mode of acceptable modes of investigation are material investigation. So therefore, we have to accept the existence of the brain, blah, 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 right? If I'm going to argue philosophically, I have to sure. knock down that foundation and say, okay, that's not the only way of investigation. There's other, there's another way of investigation, which is first person investigation of ourselves. That is a separate mode of investigation, which can never be replicated by the scientific. Um, now, if you ask me on that basis, which is what I responded, then I'd have to do self inquiry. And then what happens is the, um, the falseness of the question arises because it's like it seems like it means something but it doesn't so um <laughs> so yeah so yeah so so we have to argue with one of the two yeah. angles yeah, I, does that make sense? I, I mean i completely agree i mean you know and and and, 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 and totally agree that the method of self-inquiry uh -huh. whether you use a materialistic uh, framework or a non-materialistic framework is pretty significant in that, in that whole book. well yeah because but, materialism will not allow this yeah, to happen at all well, my right? only question is because the brain is the substratum on which either inquiry is so because if, if the person was a lunatic or some or the dementia or, or, or whatever it is right such a process will not be possible the brain has a role there you know the entire process i mean the mind so, has a role right so the brain is just a manifestation the, or yeah I, I, the reason my brain is i'm just sticking to the physical realm for those who want to who are comfortable with the physical realm right because the mind arises there is no mind if there's no brain if okay. you take your brain and take your brain out of the human thing. Okay, sure. There's yeah. no mind. Sure. Right? Sure, yeah, it's it's yeah. a body might, you know, yeah. or even parts of the brain, if I remove, some body function could continue with sure, the mind sure. might go away. Sure. That's why I was saying the so brain is very relevant in this whole thing and its whole neural network, everything. So this whole keeping so, the brain and this whole process is pretty useful, I think. Mm, it's like deep sleep. I, I'm not sure I agree with that because because the <laughs> thing is, again, it, it, there's there's two completely like very different modes of investigation okay. that are being taken here. You know, there is just what I'm experiencing right okay. now, right? That's that's what we're doing. We're, we're just, inquiry is basically an investigation of our experience, like a direct 
investigation of our subjective experience, right? The brain is a concept that is used, it's used to categorize something in a, sure. for a scientific series of theories, right? It's a like, thinker. Brain is a thinker. No, brain is Body, an idea. mind, intellect, perceiver, feel a thinker, right? No, yeah, you can you can say that if you want. I mean, you know, it depends on what we depends on how we're depends on how we're looking at things. But um, my my point is simply this: that that why is this not all due to the brain? Is is that that very question is coming from a materialistic scientific outlook sure. yes. for sure. Yes. So you have to undermine that something. And ultimately, though, I can present what I think are very good arguments against that outlook as being uh, true. Um, I do also think it's the case that at a deep level, uh, this has to ring a bell in you, that there has to be some intuition that ah, this cannot be all there is. The visible cannot be all there is. Because we are dealing with the divine. The divine the point of the divine is that which is invisible, unconceptualizable, which cannot be imagined. And um, yet, nevertheless, it's right here. We're experiencing it continuously. So there's a paradox there that science cannot comprehend. So if you limit yourself to the scientific framework and you're like, okay, well, how can you prove God of that framework? You can't because that framework has already limited the term within which you can move. You have already created a prison from which you, uh, you can't extricate yourself because you have defined, um, you defined out the relevant thing. And it's, it's, and it's, um, and it's an incorrect defining out, I think. But it would require more, uh, well, more discussion. So I understand that. that there is a consistency basis for science, which probably precludes some no unknowable truths outside of itself. There may be truths outside yeah. things that science does not know. Yeah. But when you go and jump into that realm, there are a billion ways to deal with yours because there is no, there is no radar, there is no radar there. There's well, okay, so yeah, so you're right. There are many ways to deceive ourselves, but the truth is there's many ways to deceive yourself in science too. The science is done by people. People are self-delusional. So, so, yeah, so. That's really the problem there is that in the science, you have to have a rational group of people One guy is wrong, the next guy is totally wrong. So the, so I the mean, city is invisible, but the, you, can, you can measure it in the light, right? You can see it in the light. But, see, again, we can, you know, okay, so. I'll say again two things. So one is, you know, we'd have to go deep into philosophy of science, right? But the truth of the matter is, if you really look at philosophy of science, which I'm not an expert in, but I have read some, you know, in it, um, science is much, much more liable to bias than you think. Okay. The reality is we want to think, oh, it's just all measurable and it's easily testable and falsifiable. But the reality is actually, um, for example, you test something, okay? It doesn't come out the way that you wanted it to come out. So you say, oh, the instrument was wrong. The instrument was faulty. And how do you know that's not the case, that's right? That's there are, there's a million variables. You could be like, oh, my theory, my pet theory is correct. Some other theory, which is related to it, that theory is wrong. You know, there's all kinds of ways to play. And, but, you know, that's a look. You know, that's a look. I'm not going to say that there isn't, um, science doesn't have some kind of um, uh, useful, uh, useful tool in terms of testing. It does, but there is an internal testing that one can do. Um, and uh, what to do? There are things which are not testable in that way, but are the supremely important things. So How what do you do? do? In the end, ultimately, there is a means of knowledge of which the mind cannot conceive. That's the answer. So the answer is, you will have to find it for yourself. That, that there is something beyond a doubt but if it could be explained, then it would be doubtable. There is something which is known for certain, but if I could speak it, then it would not be known. <laughs> so basically it's not verified. It's verifiable, Object. but not, Object. but not Object. to anybody else. It's not, it's, yeah, yeah it's, it, you might say it's objectively verifiable in some sense, although even that's a problem because as soon as it's objectively verifiable, then you're verifying it to me. But the problem is not really verified to me. Me is also an object. So there is something which there is something which, there is something which is certain, but I can't prove it. Nobody can prove it. But it's absolutely certain, but no one can prove it. 
but it's Sounds absolutely good. certain. This is the paradox. Because there's, a, there's another instrument knowledge which we have in some sense, which cannot be proven to anybody else. And so either that rings a bell, I mean, there's good reason to believe it. Again, we could, we could go into detail, uh, not like the second, but no, go into detail about why that is. But um, why, would we, why would we believe that to be the case? I think the answer you believe it to be the case is A, because it rings a bell, B, there's good philosophical reasons for it. C, you can point to testimony of sages across cultures, across time, which seem to say certain things which are consistent with each other in different religions. You know, uh, they're all speaking about the same thing in a way. Um, but yeah, but, um, but ultimately it's, it's because at some level, we know there are people, there's a sense that one has, there is something other than what is visible. I know it, I know it, there is something. That sense we have to follow. So, um, yeah, I don't know, I don't know what to say, but right now, you, you, if you wanted it, if you wanted it to go deep into the philosophical questions, we'd have to, we'd have to do that, it would take a while. Yeah, we should yeah. do this after tomorrow. Yeah. How do you explain yeah. some of like, the people at work, the body is functioning, but my, Nothing, they don't know what's going on. And some of them can't even speak. Some of them just babble. Or like uh, when uh, some people get very old and they have Alzheimer's and they don't recognize the people that they lived all their with their life. And well, what kind of explanation? I mean, you can say karma. But the, but 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 is that not the explanation you're looking for? Well, I mean, what kind of explanation you're looking for? The real answer is the best answer is who's asking the question? See, because what happens is, like I say, right there, there is the foundational sense of I. From that sense of I, you get the sense of um, things happening at all. Things happening at all. The idea that things are happening at all is based on the foundational sense of I. Only when you acknowledge that things are happening at all, do you have questions about why they happen as they do. But are things happening at all? That's the question. You see, it only seems as if there are things happening because you believe you exist as a separate individual. When you investigate that deeply, this, this idea will be destroyed at source. You know? That's the best thing. If we say things are happening, then we ask why things are happening, then we then, then we are forced into different modes of explanation. You have to say, you have to give a scientific explanation, or you have to say karma, or you have to say God's will, or you have to say, you know, any number of things. But none of those explanations will be fully satisfactory. Because the real answer is, it's not the case that things are happening in the way that they seem to be happening. It's not the case that things are happening as they seem. That's the, that's the, that's the actual thing. That's the fact. So any other questions on Zoom or in person? Any of you have any questions? Okay. Yeah. All right. So I think we'll. And then call tomorrow morning we are meeting at um, seven yeah. in Mahakaleshwar Temple, seven to eight, and then evening. Um, My house. Oh. All of you are invited. Please join. No. Seven thirty. And they evening 7 30, but morning 7 a.m. Today is the exception. <laughs> because first day he wants to explain. Mm -hmm. But try to be there by 7 15, so we are all settled down before they come. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what time? 7 30. 7 15, you come. He will start at 7 30. Tomorrow is here. Yeah. Yeah. Please do come. Yeah. And all of you, all of you. And morning, okay. do come for the meditation. Yes. The address is there in the base, please. Yeah. So, can we do the Brahma? Put him up.
Uh, I, I don't really do that, actually. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> but, do you have the white thread across your... Mm, I don't. Uh, you don't? <laughs> no. Nope. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, you should not ask. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all. Thank you so thank much. You so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. 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 Thank you.